Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, okay, Mansi, well, that was such a kind introduction. Um, <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining and again for tearing yourself away from those HST proposals. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, searching for electromagnetic counterparts to high energy neutrinos. I know it's not necessarily the most popular strand of astrophysics here at Cahill, so I'm gonna start by taking a step back and asking the question, what are astrophysical neutrinos? And if you've ever seen a talk on this topic before, it's pretty mandatory that you start with this photograph here. So this is Victor Hess in 1912, and at the time it was known that there was this level of ionizing radiation that was measured all over the surface of the Earth, and it was thought that this ionizing radiation came from within the Earth, it was terrestrial. And so Victor Hess had this idea, I'll go up in my balloon, I'll measure the level of radiation, the higher I go, the less radiation I'll measure. So he went and he did this experiment, and what he found was totally the opposite of what he was expecting. So the higher he went, the more radiation he measured. And that kind of starts our, our grand story of measuring um, particles from space, because what he found was that this radiation was of cosmic origin, and he dubbed the phenomenon cosmic rays. Um, now today is the first day of LIGO 04, so multi-messenger astronomy is really a hot topic in 2023, but the idea that there's more to astronomy than photons really started back here over 100 years ago. So what have we learned in the last 100 years? Well, the first thing we've learned is that despite being named cosmic rays, cosmic rays are not actually rays at all. Instead, they are particles. They are charged particles that are accelerated in cosmic sites and eventually reach the Earth. And so nowadays you don't just have one man in a balloon, but instead you have something like the Pierre Auger Observatory shown here on the left that spans absolutely enormous um, portions of the Earth. So this is you know, several hundred or thousand square kilometers of instrumented detector uh, area in order to detect cosmic rays that extend up to extremely high energies. So if you measure the spectrum, you see something that looks a little like this. And um, in case you can't see, it goes from 10 to the nine to 10 to the 21 electron volts. So this is 12 orders of magnitude. We know that the low energies, they likely come from the sun. In the middle, we think that they're from galactic sources. And then at even higher energies, it's a bit more of a mystery. Um, and I just wanna emphasize, when you're talking about the very highest energy particles, 10 to the 21 electron volts, is the equivalent of giving a nucleus the energy of a baseball or a tennis ball. It's truly gigantic, and it's really hard to do that as well. I mean, we have the Large Hadron Collider at Earth that's the best that we can do as humans, and you can get a particle up to sort of 10 to the 12 electron volts. To get up to 10 to the 21, you need absolutely crazy extreme natural cosmic accelerators. And I think that's really the big picture item that we've learned from cosmic rays is that there are natural cosmic accelerators out there. And as astronomers, it would be really nice to sort of understand where they are, how particles get accelerated in them, and generally learn some things about the universe by, by using these. 
So that brings me to astroparticle physics. Um, the, the unfortunate thing about cosmic rays is that they are charged particles. Um, and that means that they get deflected by magnetic fields. The universe is full of magnetic fields. Um, and that means that by the time a cosmic ray will reach the Earth, even if you can detect that cosmic ray perfectly, even if you can uh, reconstruct perfectly where it arrives um, towards the Earth, that still won't tell you very much about its origin because as you can kind of see in the illustration here, like the cosmic ray might follow a bendy, windy pattern and end up sort of going from this direction. So it's actually very difficult to track the origin of cosmic rays. Um, and that presents us with a puzzle. But as I mentioned before, this is the age of multi-messenger astronomy. And um, as you may have guessed, there are more messengers that we can consider to try and unravel more about this, this mystery. And one of them is the neutrino. And in many respects, a neutrino is pretty much perfect messenger. So if you have cosmic rays being produced um, at distant sites and the cosmic rays interact with matter or photons, they will produce secondary particles. They will produce photons and they will produce neutrinos. Photons at high energies, so something like 10 to the 15 electron volts, can get absorbed very easily, like if you have a cloud of dust or they'll just scatter off the CMB, for example. But neutrinos are electrically neutral, so they travel in straight lines and they interact only via the weak force, and they have a very small cross-section. So they can go through dust, they can go through matter, they can go all the way through the Earth if they want to, um, and that makes them pretty much ideal. So nowadays, it's very common to try and un unravel the mysteries of cosmic ray acceleration by trying to study neutrinos. So it seems easy. All you need to do is build a neutrino telescope. Unfortunately, the problem with building a neutrino telescope is that all the things that make neutrinos great messengers also make them very difficult to detect. So neutrinos are electrically neutral and they have tiny cross sections. Uh, so what you need to do is have something with an absolutely enormous detector volume to have even a small chance of detecting one or two. Uh, and that brings me to the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. So this is the world's largest neutrino observatory. It is located at the geographic South Pole in Antarctica. What was done is that you go to the South Pole, you drill down through two and a half kilometers of glacier ice, you lower a string into that hole, and on the string you have PMTs, just you know, detecting photons, evenly spaced along the string for about a kilometer. And then you do that not just once, but you do that 86 times, and then you end up with this kind of grid system, and within the grid you have then 6,000 individual PMTs covering one cubic kilometer, hence the name Ice Cube. And just to really emphasize this, I mean, one cubic kilometer is enormous. This little smudge here is supposed to represent the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower is large, and Ice Cube is absolutely gigantic, even compared to the Eiffel Tower. And it's good that it's so big, because that means it can actually measure uh, particles if you're lucky enough. So if you have a neutrino that, for example, has traveled through the Earth and then happens to interact with a nucleon in the ice, then you can get an interaction and you can produce a muon. And if you have a muon, muons can travel many, many kilometers in ice, and that muon might traverse your detector. And then if you'd look in ice cube data, what you'd see is something that looks a little bit like this. I'm sorry about the color, it's hard to see. But basically, uh, this is color coded, so each ball represents one um, ice cube uh, DOM that detected photons. They're color coded so that red is early time, blue is late time, and green is in the middle. And the size of the balls represent how much light was measured. And you can kind of imagine that IceCube has algorithms to look at this distribution of light and say a particle started here, moved here, and ended here at the other end. And so with that information, you can reconstruct the trajectory of the muon with relatively good precision, so to a couple of square degrees on the sky. And that means that you don't just have a neutrino detector, but you have a neutrino telescope. You're actually able to do astronomy now because you're able to detect particles and work out from what direction they came from. The other nice thing is that, as I said, you can measure the amount of photons emitted at each point in the detector. And if you sum this up, you can also estimate the particle energy. And this is basically the core of how neutrino telescopes work. There are several others in the sea, but it's all the same principle. And this has uh, now been completed for uh, over 12 years. So we're starting to get a lot of data from IceCube. And what do we actually know about astrophysical neutrinos? Well, the first thing we know is that they are actually real. I mean, if you look at IceCube data, you just bin it up by energy. You see a distribution that looks something like this. Uh, it may not look very exciting if you look at the raw data, but if you do an analysis, what you find is that actually, if you try and fit the spectrum, you can't fit it with a single component. Instead, you need two different um, distinct components um, that kind of cross over around 100 TeV. 
And why is, why is it the case that you have two components? Well, as I mentioned, we're looking for astrophysical neutrinos. So you imagine you have your cosmic accelerator. It's at a cosmic distance. It's maybe in a distant galaxy. You have neutrinos that come from the cosmic accelerator. They travel all the way to ice cube here at the South Pole. However, if cosmic rays escape from the acceleration site and make it all the way to Earth, they will collide with the atmosphere and they will produce an air shower and they will also produce neutrinos. Um, and these are known as atmospheric neutrinos, but they're just neutrinos. Like a photon is a photon, a neutrino is a neutrino. These particles are indistinguishable. And so actually the unfortunate fact is that when you look at the ice cube data, you have neutrinos coming from two different origins and on an event by event basis, it's impossible to distinguish them. So at very high energies, you're more likely to have an astrophysical neutrino than an atmospheric one. But at everything below 100 TeV, you just have this absolutely enormous background rate that exceeds the astrophysical neutrino rate by several orders of magnitude. And so this is really the kind of core element of neutrino astronomy is just the process of trying to separate these two, these two spectra. You can't do it on an event by event basis, but you try to do it in a statistical way. You try and identify regions of parameter space where the neutrino, uh, the astrophysical neutrinos dominate. And so the first thing you might think to do is to just consider astrophysical sources that you know about and you see whether neutrinos are clustered around those sources. And so this has famously been done by IceCube for many, 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 many different things. And one time they actually found some evidence of a correlation. Uh, so that was for this particular rather beautiful galaxy. This is NGC 1068. This is a nearby starburst galaxy. Uh, it was predicted uh, to be a neutrino source. And when IceCube did an analysis of all of the data, what they found is that the most significant neutrino cluster across the entire sky also lined up um, with this particular galaxy. And so this is um, 4.2 sigma evidence, which is good enough in uh, neutrino astronomy terms uh, to sort of start to make a claim that actually there's evidence that this particular galaxy is emitting neutrinos. Uh, this is, I, I want to emphasize, the only case in the 10 years of IceCube data where any uh, sort of external neutrino source was tested and you found evidence of neutrino emission from that position. Um, there are many other things you might consider for broader populations, not just individual events, but think about, you know, all of the blazars in the sky, all of the GRBs in the sky, all of the TDEs or supernova 2n in the sky. And every time that IceCube has looked for a correlation in a kind of more global aggregate sense, they have not found a significant correlation. And instead, they've set an upper limit. So you have limits of blazers contributing less than 27%, um, GRBs less than 1%, TDEs less than 40%, and supernova of type 2n contributing less than 34%. So we have a lot of upper limits and uh, not a lot of knowledge uh, at this point in time. Actually, um, it's also important to note that uh, these things can change all the time depending on astronomical observations. So there was most recently, you may have heard of GRB 221009A, um, I think referred to as the boat, the brightest of all time. Um, so you can see in the figure here, I'm just showing um, the actual gamma ray flux, and it was crazy. So this was GRB 130427A, which people used to get excited about, as this is a very bright GRB. And then you look at the actual one that we measured more recently, and it's just absolutely gigantic in comparison. So estimates were done of how often an event like this would occur. And I think the, the kind of best number is once every 10,000 years. So this is truly not just once in a lifetime, but once in a civilization type event. And if you just consider the fact that IceCube, so IceCube looked for neutrinos and didn't find any. And if you extrapolate from that and you say, well, you know, how many neutrinos could there possibly be if this incredibly bright nearby source did not produce any? What you find is that it's really improbable um, for us to find neutrinos from GRBs, not just with the current detectors, but even you imagine the next generation of detectors get built. Uh, the sensitivities of them are plotted here in this uh, plot on the left. So this is the work I have in prep. And you can see that the limit you get just from extrapolating the non-detection here already um, exceeds the, the sensitivity of the detector. So what this is telling us is that actually it's really hard to make GRB neutrinos. Um, just based on observational evidence, it seems like really unlikely that this once incredibly um, popular source of new, uh, neutrinos actually producing neutrinos in the end. I mean, there's a lot of theoretical excitement about these in the 90s and early 2000s before anyone tested the theories, but now it's becoming increasingly challenging. So if you have one probable source and a lot of not detections, um, you probably need to rethink your approach. Um, and this is exactly what IceCube did. So this brings me to real-time neutrino astronomy. So previously, it's always been a very sort of one-way street where 
astronomers would go and find things and publish them, and then Ice Cube um, people would kind of think, oh, maybe there's neutrinos from this, so I'll go and test that theory. Uh, but actually, nowadays, we can flip the entire sequence around. So we know that Ice Cube can detect neutrinos, and we know that they can localize them. And since 2016, they don't just localize the neutrinos, but they then report them promptly. Um, so they'll say, just like LIGO does, for example, a neutrino came from that direction on the sky, it's covering a couple of square degrees, and um, this is the rough energy um, that that neutrino has. And then what you can do is astronomers around the world can then point their telescopes, look and see if they can find a possible electromagnetic counterpart. And that brings me to the ZTF neutrino follow-up program a little closer to home to talk about the process of actually doing this, to try and identify neutrino sources using these ice cube alerts. So I think everyone here is probably familiar with ZTF, um, at least I hope so, but let me just recap again the ZTF scans the entire northern sky every two nights to a depth of 20.5 in G and R. It's located at the Palomar Observatory, and it just has a, a really unrivaled, complete accounting of the dynamic optical sky. So ZTF knows when things explode, it knows what happened last night, it knows what happened at the same location three nights ago, five nights ago, seven nights ago, and so on. And so it's a really powerful tool for us to understand um, the, the way that the night sky varies in optical and to test whether things that change in time might be correlated with neutrinos. So what we do is when IceCube releases one of these neutrino alerts, they give us a localization within a couple of hours, um, and we generally trigger TOO observations. We then um, try and combine them and do an analysis on them, and at the end we hope to find a possible electromagnetic counterpart. This diagram here makes it look like what we're doing is really complicated. Um, and I'm probably supposed to make you think that it is complicated, but it's actually very simple indeed. I mean, we just try and remove things that are not transient, so things that are, for example, stars and asteroids, um, and then we just look for things that are actually spatially and temporally coincident with a neutrino. So you might detect 500,000 objects a night, but the number that are actually in the localization will be very small. Um, and then of those, you look for things that are detected off the neutrino, you're usually left with just a handful of objects, so maybe two, three, or five. And then we have a lot of different spectroscopic programs. So for example, at Keck and many other instruments, where we then try and classify them. And I think at this stage, basically what we're trying to do is just do an unbiased census of optical transients that are coincident with neutrinos. Um, however, obviously we have our Bayesian prize as well. So if we think that something looks particularly interesting, what we also seek to do is then, if we find something that looks like a potential counterpart, Alert people get prompt electromagnetic observations to try and characterize the source as fully as we can, and then um, generally try and understand better how this particular source might have produced neutrinos. So what might we be looking for? I mentioned several different populations. If you restrict yourself to things that are bright in the optical and would be time varying, um, then you're kind of left with five main contenders here. So you have, as I mentioned, gamma ray bursts, you can also have supernova with failed jets, so things that uh, get choked um, and, uh, in the outer stellar debris layers, or so, sorry, the stellar, stellar layers, um, because neutrinos, as I said, are able to travel through matter without much trouble. So you would not see any gamma rays, but the neutrinos would just shoot out anyway. The other thing is that you can have CSM interactions, so when you have uh, particularly supernova type 2n, you can think about looking for neutrinos. Uh, there are also active galactic nuclei, and in particular blazars. There's ones with relativistic jets pointing towards us, uh, and then also tidal disruption events. Um, and now, I'm not going to keep you in suspense any longer because Mansi kind of stole the punchline here that what we did find on one occasion was actually a probable electromagnetic counterpart. So this is what we found um, after our follow-up on of IC 191001A. Uh, it doesn't look very impressive. These are the two nights of TOO observations that we got. It's three data points. But of course, ZTF is observing all the time. And so when we look in the, the ZTF data, what we find is that there is actually you know, a transient there. And we can see that the transient is interesting and also that actually there were a lot of extensive um, archival follow-up of this transient that already existed. So we already had a good handle on what this might be and how it was evolving. And then having found this, we then trigger basically follow up across an electromagnetic spectrum. So we get spectra, we get more UV observations, we get X-ray observations, we get radio observations, and we just generally try and pin down um, in this particular source what is going on. And so this particular source was a tidal disruption event known as AT2019 DSG. And this was kind of the, the first case where one of these follow-ups in optical produced um, a probable electromagnetic counterpart. 
So let me just spend 30 seconds recapping what a tidal disruption event is. Um, we know that at most, if not all, at the center of most, if not all galaxies, there is a supermassive black hole. And sometimes there is a star that's unlucky enough to be approaching that black hole on a parabolic orbit. And so the thing about black holes is, you know, they're massive and they have a force of gravity. And even in high school, you might have learned that the force of gravity is proportional to 1 over r squared. And what that will mean for the star is that the front of the star gets pulled a bit more strongly than the back of the star. And the star experiences this net tidal force, it, it gets stretched. And the closer the unlucky star gets to the black hole, the more extreme the tidal force becomes. And then at some point, um, it will exceed the self-gravity that's holding the star together, and the star will disintegrate. And then, this is what you see in panel three, you have a tidally disintegrated star, so you have a so-called tidal disruption event. And once you've done that, you've just shredded a star. So there's a huge amount of stellar debris, much of which is still gravitationally bound to the supermassive black hole in the center. And in general, you expect it to eventually form an accretion disk. It becomes hot. It emits a lot of photons. And this is then something we can see. And so ZCF has found a lot of these now. And uh, you can also see them at many other wavelengths. And this is uh, this AT2019 DSG was just the latest example. So why would we be excited to find a TDE coincident with a high energy neutrino? Um, I mean, I mentioned that people had predicted neutrinos might come from TDEs, but I think more than that, I really want to emphasize that TDEs are rare. Um, I mean, they're sort of intrinsically rare, and even though ZTF can find them, there just aren't so many in the sky. I mean, this particular one was the second brightest in the entire sample known to that point. And, you know, the northern sky is 20,000 square degrees, and you can picture you have maybe 15 or 20 active um, in total in this period. And so even if you account for the fact that you don't look just one neutrino, but you try for many different ones to find an electromagnetic counterpart, you still find that it's just very unlikely to find a TDE accidentally. It's actually very hard to do. Um, so we estimate that accounting for all the neutrino follow-up that we did, the total sky area we covered, it was still under 100 square degrees. And the chance that you find a TDE by accident is 0.8%. So this is kind of the, the first stage of neutrino follow-up with ZTF that we did. We, we found this result. We published all of the data that we had. Um, and then um, this was a, a Nature Astronomy paper a couple of years ago. And what we found immediately is that there was a lot of interest from theorists trying to understand um, how tidal disruption events might produce neutrinos. And in particular, a lot of the models were pretty rudimentary, to be honest. Um, that existed before because not much was known about TDEs. There just weren't so many in 2017 to study. And we really had a pretty complete data set. So we knew things like, for example, we got X-ray observations. We knew how the X-ray light curve of the source evolved. We had a measure of the black body temperature of the TDE, how that evolved over time. We got radio observations. We observed an outflow. We saw how the outflow changed over time. Uh, we had a good handle on the black hole mass and the energetics of the system. And all of these things are very important things that go into neutrino production models. And most of the time, theorists don't really know what to, to choose necessarily because there's just not a good average number for them. And in this case, we were able to provide very specific measurements, and these really inform the theoretical modeling. And so there were many papers. I don't have time to highlight all of them, but there was this nice review by Hayasaki et al. in 2021 summarizing the main, let's say, strands or genres of neutrino production models. Uh, and they generally focused on four different potential areas. So the first, and um, in, in the past most popular model, was ones focusing on relativistic jets. Because occasionally, uh, tidal disruption events can launch a relativistic jet that's sort of like a transient version of a blazar. Um, in this case, AT2019 DSG did not have a relativistic jet, so they don't really apply so much. But this, is, this was sort of the previous um, most common method of um, imagining neutrinos from TDEs. But there are actually a lot of other models which resemble more AGN and more like, for example, NGC 1068, the, the um, neutrino source that I mentioned earlier. So you have an accretion disk, and you can imagine neutrino production also in the disk corona and in the winds and outflows. I mean, the basic idea, it's actually like any simple particle physics experiment. You basically just need to accelerate particles, and then you need to collide them with something. They need a target. And the target can be for example, photons of particular energies, X-ray or UV, and TDEs have them in abundance. Or you can also have um, matter, like debris around, for example, a black hole. These, these are kind of the two, two general ways of producing neutrinos. So 
that was all well and good, but as Menzi said, you know, you find something once, it has a kind of 0.2% chance coincidence probability, it doesn't convince everyone, probably rightly, to be honest. But we didn't just stop there, so we continue to follow up neutrinos um, from then on. So this is kind of a histogram um, just showing the number of neutrino follow-up campaigns that we do. And to give you an idea, IceCube produces one neutrino alert every two weeks, and we follow up about one-third of them, something like that. So many of them get retracted, or they're close to the sun, or they're not high quality, but the ones that are high quality, we generally get nearly all of them with ZTF. Um, and we just get higher and higher statistics every year. So we're now, this, this plot goes up to 2021, where we had 24 neutrino follow-up campaigns, but we've continued to do that. Um, so now we're up to, I think, 31 or 32. Um, and we're generally uh, completing a, a much higher statistic census of optical transients close to neutrinos. And what's particularly interesting is that we already, um, in a short amount of time, um, just after the, the first one was published, identified a second probable um, neutrino TDE association. So this was known as AT2019 FDR. Um, this was another very bright um, candidate TDE. Uh, you can see the light curve here. Um, and in this case, uh, what well, you can imagine, right, if you are unlikely to find one TDE by chance, you're very unlikely to find two by chance. And so we estimate at this point that the probability um, of finding two such TDEs by chance is 0.034%, which corresponds to 3.4 sigma. So at this point, um, we kind of published the second result and then started thinking immediately, we have two objects. What can we learn about these objects? Is there anything special or unusual about them uh, that can maybe inform us about which uh, TDEs might be producing neutrinos or not? Are there any interesting conditions or commonalities between these? So this got us thinking beyond optical follow-up, and very early on what we identified that was quite unexpected, I have to say, um, was that we found that both TDEs had extremely luminous uh, so-called dust echoes. So TDEs are very nice, like you have in general like a nice quiet system, a black hole at the center not doing very much, then you suddenly throw a star in the mix and like bam, you're turning on a light bulb and you can kind of see in real time in the accretion process on a human friendly time scale of you know, a couple of years, see this whole system evolving. And if you have a lot of dust, what can happen is that the, the optical and UV photons from the TDE can get absorbed and then reflected back to you um, at, at infrared wavelengths. And fortunately for us, the WISE um, satellite observes uh, the sky on a re very regular cadence of every few months. And so you can kind of, for any point in the sky, look up and see what it was doing at mid infrared wavelengths. And so what we found when we looked at these two was that indeed they had a lot of very luminous mid infrared emission consistent with a dust echo. And you know, you think maybe this is interesting, but if you're a scientist, you should really quantify what is interesting. Is this normal? Is this unusual? And so what we did was a much more comprehensive systematic analysis of everything that ZTF had detected in a nucleus um, over the course of the entire survey. So we just looked at every single optical transient that was nuclear, which had also been detected in some way by WISE. So just to give you a sense of context, ZTF has detected maybe three or four or 5,000 good nuclear transients in the course of like the last five years. And so quite a lot of them are also detected in WISE. So I can just firstly talk you through this plot that you're seeing here. So on the x-axis, you have the black hole mass. Um, and on the y-axis, you have the measured strength of the infrared flares that were found. So we use this kind of significance metric. So we use the amplitude of the flare divided by the RMS of the entire mid-infrared light curve. So with TDEs, you expect you have this one single bright event. Whereas you also find, for example, AGN, because AGN flare at every single wavelength all of the time. And they are also often detected in mid-infrared. But what you can see is that they cluster really around here very substantially, where they have one flare, but it's not really much bigger than all of the other flares that they have. It's just up and down bouncy light curve. And TDEs really stand out. I mean, you can see AT2019 DSG at the top is the brightest of all of the, the dust echoes that have been measured for any nuclear transient in, in ZTF. Um, and this kind of got us thinking about whether this was actually just a good method in general to find TDEs, even aside from neutrinos. And what we found is that actually, I mean, you can just see it from the plot here, that that is indeed the case. There is this very clear separation between AGN here with the squares and TDEs and probable TDEs here marked in blue. Like you have this regime above, okay, here this is like 10, 12, 13 or so. And above that, you just have very little AGN contamination at all. The other thing to note is that tidal disruption events, you have a star falling into a black hole, 
And there is a specific point at which that happens. You can work it out. It's the tidal radius. And this will scale with the mass of the black hole. But the other thing that scales with the mass of the black hole is the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. So if you have a more massive black hole, it's bigger. And at some point, the Schwarzschild radius wins. So it becomes larger than the tidal radius. And what that means is that if you have a star that would do a tidal disruption, it will go past the Schwarzschild radius and get swallowed whole. And that occurs around 10 to the 8 solar masses for the host. I mean, it varies a little depending on the spin and so on. But like the first order, it's roughly this number. And so you just you don't expect to ever see a TDE above um, a mass of 10 to the 8 solar masses. This is actually one of the first ways that people became convinced that these flares in, in the nucleus of galaxies actually were TDEs, is that you never found them in really massive TDE, uh, sorry, in really massive hosts where you wouldn't expect TDEs. And what we find is that actually it is exactly the case here as well with this mid-infrared selection method. There are no bright dust echoes in this regime where we don't think TDEs should be possible. And in this regime where we do think TDEs are possible, there's suddenly plenty of them. And of the ones that are spectroscopically classified, the vast majority of them turn out to be TDEs. So this is actually a good method, even aside from spectra, of looking at the nucleus of galaxies and finding probable TDEs. And so at that point, uh, we obviously uh, looped back to the neutrino question and, and said, there's only you know, 60 or so sources here. Are any of them coincident with neutrinos? And what we found is that there was a third example, uh, one of the three here that sort of was hidden by the, the circle. Uh, this was um, another TDE-like flare in, a nuclear, like in, in the nucleus of a galaxy, found an optical with a very substantial dust echo following it, and a, a neutrino detected. So I think this is just highlighting to us that we really need to consider the infrared wavelengths a whole lot more seriously. Even aside from neutrinos, it's an excellent way of finding TDEs, and there's a lot we can learn and a lot that maybe we don't understand yet. And that segues very nicely into something you might see if you go to the Palomar Science Meeting that's going to be happening um, next week. Uh, if you go up to the catwalk of the P200, if you're lucky enough to see the sunset, you'll also notice there is this new dome. Um, and if you look at it, what you will actually find is that this is a new uh, camera and a new telescope. This is the Wide Field Infrared Transient Explorer Winter. So this is a survey that we are going to start up um, at Palomar very soon. I mean, when I say very soon, it's shipping this week, and we hope to be on sky within the next week or the next couple of weeks. So this is a very imminent thing. And what winter is, it is a near infrared sky survey. So it has a one square degree field of view. Um, and the telescope is actually already there. Um, so it's currently got an optical camera summer hooked up to it. Um, and it's going to do a sky survey. It's going to do electromagnetic follow up of gravitational waves and many other science cases. So it's basically co-production between Caltech and MIT. It has three filters, Y, J, H, and the, I think the core science or the thing that I'm most interested in is a sky survey going to a depth of maybe 20.5 mag and J. I mean, this needs to still be finalized exactly what the, the cadence and exposure times look like. But this is something that was not previously possible because of the cost of um, all of the equipment. Um, there's a lot of new technology, specifically in gas detectors, that this telescope is going to be using which enable you to cheaply build sensitive infrared cameras. So there is a whole generation of new cameras coming online that are going to be surveying the sky in the near infrared for the very first time to comparable depths to ZTF, for example. And as you may have guessed, what I, I'm really excited to do is a panchromatic neutrino follow-up. So the idea is almost identical to neutrino follow-up with ZTF. But the idea is that actually, you know, winter is going to be right next to ZTF. And for some well-localized events, we will be able to get simultaneous coverage in the optical and the near infrared as well. So things that, for example, are dusty or obscured or intrinsically faint in optical but brighter at infrared wavelengths, this is something we'll be able to measure. Um, and in general, maybe we find things we don't expect or we just find another example of a TDE that's also bright in infrared. Uh, we really don't know, but I think it's, it's going to be very exciting to find out. So maybe I can step back a bit and think about what we've actually learned from neutrino follow-up programs. Because as I said, we've been doing this for several years. Now we're getting more statistics. Um, and one of the interesting things we found is what we didn't find, what we didn't see. I mean, if you think that you've done 30 neutrino follow-up campaigns and you haven't found a particular example of XYZ source, at some point that starts to become statistically significant and you start to be able to say things about the underlying neutrino source population. And so what we did is we published this paper in MNRAS this year, basically trying to understand um, 
what sort of neutrino source population would be compatible with a non-detection? And we essentially derived um, the, an upper limit on the optical luminosity function of neutrino sources. So if you look at very bright things, um, so okay, this is 20, minus 26, it's crazy bright, but this is comparable to, for example, the, uh, the, uh, a blazer flare that was associated with a neutrino. And we just didn't find any more in any of our neutrino follow-up campaigns. And if you think of superluminous supernova, we also didn't find any. Um, and so you can derive these limits here, which basically constrain how bright a uh, neutrino source population can be, regardless of what the actual underlying physics is. It, it's just a case of us not having found it. We can already exclude that they can be very bright. And as time goes on, these limits will become more and more constraining, and we're going to start to be able to constrain much more strongly how many neutrinos could be produced in, for example, superluminous supernova. Of course, Rubin is looming on the horizon, and this is something that I'm personally very excited about. And you might wonder how Rubin might change the game. What would neutrino follow-up look like in the era of Rubin? And the, the answer, maybe unsurprisingly, is that if you would imagine this hypothetical world where we did exactly the same neutrino follow-up campaigns, but we had Rubin instead of ZTF. So we somehow had unlimited spectroscopy, and we were able to push to 24th bag and do a census of everything, and we still didn't find anything there. Uh, then what we would have been able to do is substantially constrain these fainter transients which currently aren't being probed. So, for example, supernova 2n, these sorts of things then start to be um, constrainable directly with ribbon. But the other thing you can do instead of waiting for an expensive new telescope is you can just keep going because actually we're getting statistics all the time and at the very bright end, as you can see, ribbon doesn't help at all because ZTF is already more than good enough. Um, so what we project here is what we would do if we just continue to do neutrino follow-up campaigns as we are doing. Um, so this was 24 when the paper was published, but I said now we're already at like 32. And if you imagine at the end of ZTF, we may be somewhere here in the green line. This is sort of 48. And we're already being able to constrain, uh, for example, superluminous supernova very uh, much more strongly. So I think this is just, it's not a very exciting thing to say, but I think we just need to stick at this and acquire more statistics before we can start to answer some of the questions that we're really um, interested in learning about sources of neutrinos. However, if you like things a bit more fast paced, uh, you can also think about things that we can learn um, for neutrinos just by directly considering astronomy questions, because there's actually so much that we don't know about TDEs, um, it's really unbelievable. So I, I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about the ZTF TDE program. So for those of you who don't know, there is um, a collaboration of astronomers in ZTF interested in TDEs, including many people here at Caltech. You have Matthew, Jean, Yuhan, Shri, myself, Vikram. Um, and in general, we just have this philosophy, no TDE left behind. Like we try and find all of the TDEs in ZTF because this is just a relatively unexplored space. We still have not really finalized the way to find TDEs and we just don't have high statistics like you would, for example, with supernova. And what we do is we fit the light curves of all of the candidate nuclear transients, and we have selection functions. So this is just one example, one projection in rise time and fade time. Um, and this is color coded again. So you have supernova 1A, and then you have AGN up here, and then you have TDEs. And you can see that the TDEs are kind of clustered in a regime separated from the 1As and the AGN. And you don't just have one of these plots, but there are actually many different plots to do with the color and the color evolution over time, how much things are cooling. And in combination, what this lets us do is select a sample that's relatively pure and then start to do follow-up and classification of those to find TDEs. And so I think this plot really summarizes it best. This is the number of TDEs that were known as a function of time across every wavelength and survey. And when ZTF started in sort of 2018, you had maybe 30 TDEs known, of which 15 were in optical, and maybe only three had good light curves with the rise and fade measured. And ZTF now has measured 80 TDEs from ZTF 1 and 2. So you're just way off the, the y-axis here. It would actually be going somewhere into the first floor. Um, and this is really exciting because this is the first opportunity that we have to really study um, a lot of the, the sort of underlying physical properties of TDEs. So for example, I want to highlight some work from Yuhan, um, which was measuring the optical TDE rate as a function of luminosity. Uh, this is on archive already, and what you can see is that you have on the x-axis the luminosity of TDEs, and on the y-axis the number of TDEs. And we're starting to know this really precisely, and if you want to understand, for example, 
How much neutrino emission can come from TDEs? The most basic question you have to answer is how many TDEs are there in the first place? And this is something we just do not know to high precision. Um, and this is really something the ZTF is able to help us answer, is trying to understand this question of how many TDEs there are and how often they occur. Of course, with ZTF, we're just measuring the optical luminosity function, but that's not the same as the total um, luminosity function because TDEs actually are measured at very different wavelengths and they seem to have a lot of different properties. And I think this plot kind of summarizes it very nicely. So this is considering the X-ray properties of TDEs. So on the X-axis, you have all of the ZTF TDEs that were detected in X-ray and you have the X-ray uh, to optical luminosity. So in this case, higher up on the plot is um, more optical than X-ray and lower down would be more X-ray than optical. And then you just compare this to the recent sky survey from Erosita, where they did a systematic search for X-ray detected TDEs. And they found this plot on the right here. And so this line corresponds to equality. And then what they found is that they found loads of basically very bright X-ray TDEs that were intrinsically less luminous in optical. So it's a completely different bias than the one that we found here. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this is X-rays, but there's there's other things to consider as well. So for example, I'd like to highlight uh, work by Jean, um, which is looking for radio selected TDEs with VLAS. This is paper in prep. Um, and in her case, she found six sources that were radio detected probable TDEs that also had optical counterparts. And the, you know, there's a lot of good indications there that the multi-wavelength properties of these um, radio selected TDEs are just a little different than the optical ones. And maybe this is telling us something important about our selection biases, or maybe it's to do with the types of TDEs that emit at different wavelengths. So one thing you may have guessed that I'm particularly excited to do is to really study in detail the impact of dust and in general, the infrared properties of TDEs. So this is just an example of AT 2019 FDR, which was the second um, TDE neutrino coincidence. And you can see this is the light curve in G, and then also these are like snapshot SEDs. And the J band where winter will be measuring is like here. And you can see that's a J band detection here. And in general, the SED evolved very dynamically over the course of the TDE. It was actually quite um, extreme and interesting. And it would really be good and currently is not possible to learn at the moment um, how common this is, uh, whether the, like what does a J band TDE um, look like on average? We, we just don't know like what they look like in aggregate, whether there are different subpopulations. We just don't have a good idea. And this is something we're gonna be able to do with exquisite detail. We'll be able to follow up every single ZTF detected TDE in the near infrared, and hopefully develop a near infrared selected sample of TDEs um, from that initial sample. So we, we look for things only in the near infrared, and then we see what the optical properties are. Um, and I think in general, uh, this is not really a scientific plot, but this is just how I'm thinking about TDEs at the moment. I mean, if you kind of add, like summarize all of the things that we know about them, we have TDEs that are detected in the optical and the UV, and we have TDEs detected in the X-ray, the radio, and the IR. And we have very few examples that are detected in all of these wavelengths, and we have many examples that are detected only in two or three and have upper limits for the others. And we really want to understand how this picture fits together how many TDEs there actually are, and in general, like what decides which, which bucket a TDE will fall into? Like what are the relative numbers that exist and we expect, and do we, do we understand why? And so maybe just now to take one step back even further and think about that's measuring the local TDE rate, but how could we, how could we imagine just understanding how TDEs evolve with cosmic redshift, for example? Like how could we know what the TDE redshift was, uh, sorry, the TDE rate was at redshift 0.5? And I think, again, the ZTF um, example is really instructive. So if you just look at ZTF nuclear transients, um, you'll get a histogram that looks like this. So it's sort of like maybe depending on your cuts, 98.5% uh, of things you see in the nucleus of a galaxy that have an optical flare are not TDEs, and 1.5% are TDEs. So it's a really very tiny fraction. Um, and we would love to do something like, for example, find lots of TDEs with Rubin, which in principle is possible because Rubin will see very deep. And the problem is gonna be that we just won't be able to get spectra of all of these. So we're gonna to have to try and work out ways of finding TDEs without relying on all of the great spectroscopic programs that have aided us up to this point with ZTF because it, you know, it's manageable if it's a couple of targets a month. It's not manageable if it's like 50 or 100 candidates a month. So what do you do? Um, the only thing you need to do is open up a newspaper and you'll see a headline that looks like this. 
tinkering with ChatGPT, workers wonder, will AI take my job? Um, specifically, whether white collar workers will be uh, replaced or become more productive as a result of AI. And you just see this and you think, maybe this could be us as TDE astronomers. Maybe we could be the ones being replaced by AI. And maybe all this expensive scanning and spectroscopic follow-up that we're doing is useful to understand the basic sample, but maybe we don't need to do it forever and still we can get a lot of good science out of it. And so what I've been particularly excited about is thinking about ways that we can leverage all of the ZTF um, TDE information that we have to try and um, just learn how to find TDEs in a very efficient way without spectra. So what I did in general was I took the entire nuclear sample of TDEs and non-TDEs with ZTF. I analyzed all of the light curves. You have to basically take all of this uh, like, very comp like very large data set and compress it into something that's much more easily understandable to try and look for correlations. So you don't take a full light curve, but you, for example, look at the rise and the fade, the color over time. You look at things that any astronomer would look at, like the, the host colors. Um, how often um, the thing is detected, um, things like you know, the, the wires, colors, and, and all of this. And so what I did is I, I did all of this, and then I trained a TDE classifier on the basis of this rather simple information. And the result is that you can actually get very accurate photometric classification just using the light curves and the host data alone. So I said that 98% or 98.5% of stuff that you find in the nucleus of a galaxy is a is not a TDE, but you can reject these with 99.8% efficiency. And so what you're left with, so this plot on the right basically shows the performance if you normalize by predicted labels. So you look at everything the classifier says is not a TDE, 99.8% of the things it says are not a TDE are really not a TDE. And if you look at everything that it says is a TDE, 87% of the things that it thinks are TDEs are really TDEs. And I think, it's kind of not really been possible to do this before because we never had a large enough data set, but this probably isn't surprising if you talk to people who look for TDEs as scanners because TDEs do look different from supernovae and from AGN flares. It's just a matter of working out a way of really quantifying all of the things that we do with our eye that immediately suggest to us that XYZ thing may not be a TDE. And I think this is really exciting because I really believe that with Rubin, we're going to be able to do so well finding these TDEs purely photometrically. Rubin will have way more filters than ZTF does, so you'll get a handle on the color much better and also the color evolution. Um, the other thing is that I think when it comes to AI and you know, machines stealing your jobs and so on, um, people really <laughs> like the idea that if an astronomer tells them something is a TDE, you can say, I don't believe you, and then they'll have to justify themselves. And so one thing I really went for with this uh, TDE score, as I called it, was to embrace this concept of explainable AI, to try and really get the, the machine learning classifier to justify why it came to a decision. So I like to build this as like a classifier you can argue with. So it's quite common in machine learning that you look at all of the features that you have and you say which one is the most important on a global sense. And that gives you some indication of like what the classifier is learning and how it's uh, what it's relying on. But you can also do it in a local sense. It's equivalent to like measuring the local minima um, of a particular point and working out what the gradient is in different directions. And so if you do that, you can produce plots that look like this. So this is a real TDE. This is actually AT2019 DSG, my favorite TDE. And the classifier really thought it was a TDE. And specifically, it thought it was a TDE because the wise colors did not resemble an AGN at all. And because the peak color was blue, as TDEs should be. And also because there are a couple of negative detections, as sometimes happens for TDEs, and because when I fit it with an SN Cosmo supernova model, it just didn't fit at all. And I think this is nice because this is telling me really quantitatively which variables make the most difference. And there were 14 other features that I mentioned that, that contributed a little, but it's not really the high profile thing that you need to consider. And if you really look at this and you follow the line of justification, if I try to explain to someone why I thought AT2019 DSG was a TDE, I would really have followed a similar logic. And now let's just flip it around and imagine you have a supernova 1A, and this is real supernova 1A, and then you see um, exactly what you expect, that, yeah, this supernova 1A was in a real, like a non-AGN galaxy. So just like the previous example, it has a positive score as a result of the W1 minus W2 color. But all of the other things do not match. So the peak color is not right, it's too red. It's also cooling, as supernova do, and TDEs do not. And 
Again, the, the fraction of um, positive detections does not correspond to the average that you'd expect for a typical TDE. And I think embracing approaches like this will maybe enable us to trust classifiers a lot better and help us to kind of understand because we can never really quantify all of the sort of intangible things that go on into us making a human evaluated decision of whether we think something is probably a TDE or not. But at least having, having some method to highlight what's particularly salient for an individual source, I, I think is really helpful for evaluating. Um, and maybe in the future, really automizing all, automizing all of this work and bringing it to, to large scales. I think I have two minutes left, so I'd just like to flash one more exciting thing that I'm particularly interested in this week. So TDE classifiers will be really good at finding things that we already know about and really bad at finding totally new things that we've never, um, we've never seen before, at least one that, like the one that I set up. And so what we've seen, um, to just flash this recent result, is a ZTF TDE um, called 20ACAAZKT. Um, so this was just a relatively vanilla TDE. It was um, detected three years ago. It was fading on a TDE-like time scale. It was blue like TDEs are. And then all of a sudden, there was an astronaut this week uh, which announced that this was very dramatically rebrightening. And not just rebrightening a little, but like way beyond what it initially was. And this is a TDE, I hope uh, I'm not giving too much away to say this was TDE published um, in Yuhan's recent sample paper that I mentioned earlier, measuring the rates of TDEs. And it was also uh, a radio detected TDE as found by Gene. And it's undergoing an unprecedented rebrightening and maybe an example of a partial TDE. And I just want to emphasize this is a great unexpected example. Like I didn't see this coming when I went into work two weeks ago and suddenly it's here. And I think there's still so much we don't know about TDEs. I expect many more things like this have to be uncovered. And we won't be able to find them if we focus all of our attention just on the day-to-day -day scanning that dominates a lot of our time. And so. I think this is just a reminder that there's really a lot um, that we still don't know and hopefully we'll know soon. So I think I'm going to conclude there on my 50 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, so actually, okay, so the thing I really have to emphasize is that what you're talking about is you found one neutrino from an event. So what is the flux that produces one neutrino? It's actually a very difficult question to answer. So if you imagine a little thought experiment, like you had one TDE, it was the only TDE in the universe that produced neutrinos, then you might think the neutrino flux was sort of, on average, enough to produce an expectation of one neutrino. But imagine you had 100 TDEs, and all of them produced 0.01 neutrinos on average, and you sum the 100 together, probably one of them will produce a neutrino. Like on average, you expect to detect one, but it doesn't mean that the one you detected the neutrino from had a flux that was 100 times above what the, actual, what the intrinsic luminosity was, and all of the others were zero. So it is just extremely difficult for us to say what the actual neutrino luminosity was, but I think in general, if you do the numbers back of the envelope, it's, it's pretty clear that you could not just have these three TDEs producing neutrinos and none of the others, but also that's not my physical intuition either. Like I'd really be surprised if that was the case. So I think this is evidence that some TDEs produce neutrinos. It's not evidence that these three are really special and none of the others are capable of doing this. Uh, no, I think we would know, and there is no current evidence for a TDE. But uh, that would be very exciting. I mean, it would be far and away the nearest uh, TDE, I think. <laughs> so um, I, I think that when you look at the, like, the sort of people often model, they, they didn't just particularly pick this one out, theorists in advance, but they would mo model all of the, the galaxies that were sort of similar, either starburst or AGN activity consider where they were in the sky relative to ice cubes affected area and the luminosities involved. And it always comes up as one of the ones at the top of the list that seems most promising just in terms of proximity. But again, I really don't think I would be so amazed if that was the only one in the entire universe that was producing neutrinos. I think that's totally unrealistic. So that is a great question, and I think 
we honestly don't have a good answer. So if you ask me, my interpretation would just be that dust echoes are an excellent metric for measuring really intrinsically energetic CDEs. It's not necessarily that there's a real physical connection. I mean, in terms of, for example, you imagine whether the neutrino production mechanism could involve infrared photons, that's extremely difficult to make it work because the energy of the photons for um, producing neutrinos depends on the energy of the neutrino. So to produce neutrinos detected by ice cube, you need UV X-ray photons. You can't do it with infrared very easily. Uh, you could imagine a connection to a dust, like to the dust itself. But again, it's difficult to imagine that there's enough density to really produce neutrinos via collisions with the dust rather than via photons. It's, it's just hard when you do the numbers to come up with a scenario. So my best case um, estimate at the moment is really just, at least my understanding is that probably it's just a metric for what are really bright TDEs. And in general, like a lot of the TDEs have dust echoes. Like it's, it's very, it's not so uncommon. So I don't necessarily think there's a physical connection directly. So I know that's kind of an unsatisfying answer, but. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, so I have not. I mean, I think we would have found Scary Barbie in our neutrino follow-up campaigns, but we don't trigger on everything. So yeah, it is a good point. If we would look at all of the, like the ones that we trigger on are well localized. If you would trigger the ones that are not well localized, there's obviously more. Um, it's possible some of them or one of them would be coincident with this source. I, I don't know. It's also possible that it's not, and it's just a, you know. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, maybe I should clarify that the ZTF name, I don't even remember what it was now, but it vaguely re resembled the name Barbie, and then it was scary because it was like the most luminous thing ever. 10 to the 46. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's extremely interesting source in its own right, in any case, uh, name aside. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, this is similar to the answer I gave to Vikram, um, that probably what's happening is there's some underlying neutrino luminosity for some amount of time. So it's very hard. You can't measure a light curve with one photon. You can't measure a neutrino light curve with a single neutrino either. So, to, so I wouldn't read too much into the fact that it was detected you know, like 300 days rather than 500 or 200. But beyond that, I mean, you want to understand why a neutrino might have come relatively late. And if you look at the radio data, what you see for uh, AT 2019 DSG, for example, is that it had long-lived non-thermal emission. There was an outflow that was evolving over time. It was continuing to be powered well up to the time of neutrino detection and beyond. So I think it's also telling you that, you know, optical is a great way to find TDEs, but I would really not expect a one-to-one -one correlation that the neutrino light curve looks exactly like the optical one does. I don't think that's very realistic either. <laughs> that is a great question that I would have known off the top of my head uh, once. I think it's, it's like one in a, I don't know, one in a billion, one in a trillion. It's very small, like 10 to the minus and then lots and lots of zeros. Sorry, related to what was the thing you mentioned before? I mean, uh, X8, uh, this is scattering, uh, X8 scattering, heavy, heavy. Okay, uh, I, I honestly don't know so much about them, okay. but uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to give an answer, I'm afraid. Office number is being just before. Yeah, please send me, send me a paper, I'll look at them, and then I'll give you an answer. <laughs>